So today we invited folks to join us for an interactive workshop, an hour long. Uh, we introduced our progress on the public space management plan, which is the core piece that we're trying to gather feedback for right now. But the purpose of the workshop that we conducted was a really a lot higher level. Um, we ended up creating a game as a staff that we hope will push people to have conversations and think about what are the values they bring to the need to prioritize different kinds of public space. As a city, we can't do everything at once, but what are the values that residents hold most dear when it comes to thinking about how we use our public spaces, how we maintain our public spaces, and sort of what we look to in the future of our public spaces. And of course, when I say public spaces, I mean a sort of broad umbrella of city-owned properties that are accessible to all residents and all people who are coming through Tacoma Park. So that includes parks, it includes streets, it includes parking spaces and parklets and streeteries and you know, bike lanes and roadways and everything in between. I have been to one too many, far too many, uh, workshops and presentations that are just a boring planner talking jargon droning on at you for a couple hours and I really wanted to not have that be the case for today. So instead we decided to make it short to recognize that people have li busy lives but also centered around a game. Uh, so we created a card game that asks people to pretend they're city council members and look at a series of made up, totally fictional projects and think about how they would prioritize those based on some different factors. We had a little activity where we talked about, you know, how would people prioritize different public space plans. So, for example, if we were to have a new sidewalk um, in an area with majority uh, elderly population versus uh, new playground equipment for an area that doesn't have many playgrounds around. So how do we prioritize which projects um, to approve and which maybe to hold off on based off of different criteria. So we basically just wanted to know how do residents think about public space and how would they prioritize it so that you know that'll give us kind of an idea of how we should recommend to council you know different uh, priority levels and uh, a different way to look at uh, open or public space management plan. I was just writing down really, really fast how people um, were thinking about the activity, what they were saying. You know, some people were saying, um, I prioritize environmental sustainability over, uh, you know, projects that have to do with uh, connecting the city world or, you know, citywide. So I would just write, you know, people uh, in this workshop really prioritize environmental sustainability. So then later when we like go through the notes, we can see you know, what was really focused, maybe what did people not really talk about. You know, we want to engage as many residents as possible and, you know, hear diverse voices when we do so. So the goal is to, you know, we don't want to make a plan, you know, out of, out of nothing and out of nowhere. We want to hear people's feedback and see what's important to them so that we can, you know, systematize that. And it was a great event. It was our first workshop, so um, we're going to have a couple more throughout um, the city, like the rec department, um, some multifamily housing, duplexes and units um, on Maple Avenue. So we encourage everyone to come out if they can. Uh, we also have uh, interpreters coming to each event um, in Spanish and Amharic. Uh, all our like activities will be translated, so you know, we want to welcome everyone and anyone uh, to give us their input. I think that it went really well. Um, you know, we were nervous because this is the first time we've done something like this. And also we're coming out of a pandemic. So, you know, people are still a little bit nervous about coming to public meetings. And I think that people were really jazzed about it. It seemed like there was a lot of positive feedback about having something that was interactive and conversational. Oh, I thought the exercise was, uh, was well uh, prepared in terms of being realistic with the different options that were being placed before us and it really really took uh, a decision on, on where to place values of what projects were, were important versus just picking saying oh I'll pick this one and this one and this one yeah.
I came to the public space uh, workshop to see what they were planning and to see if I uh, could provide any input. I have a strong background in forestry and climate action, so I wanted to make sure our, our public spaces were used uh, to address those issues as well. And then uh, there's a there are ongoing equity issues in our in our community, and I. I I'd love to be able to help with that. Uh, it's great to see folks really excited to uh, look at different projects. And um, I don't know, I'm looking forward to the first draft. The process was really interesting. I mean, I think having the participants to take on a real world example and look through real world examples that were pretty similar to some of the challenges we face on council was extremely helpful. I think in ways that perhaps even the participants didn't realize at the time is that there's a number of really great ideas and great opportunities to leverage public space in a multitude of ways. But it, it really is about making choices and figuring out ways to um, come up with approaches that will benefit the most people and address the most pressing needs. So I think it was a really great exercise um, for residents to be a part of. I think this workshop is ex extremely useful to find out what people in our community would like for the open space. And I'm just sorry that there wasn't a bigger attendance and I don't know how that could be um, increased. But um, the more people that start thinking about how we can better use our open space, the better it will be for all of us. We are experiencing a time when people need to be outside more and this would be really major concern for our city, I think. It was very interesting to me, um, although it was imaginary, a lot of the stuff in it is really real because we do need things in um, Tacoma Park, especially on Maple Avenue as far as helping the senior citizens and the children, which is one of my big concerns, so um, I thought it was very useful. I think the public space workshops are really important. And even though there may not be huge numbers of people, there are different kinds of people from what's been, who have been historically involved in city affairs. And to hear from all the different perspectives has been really useful for me. My personal priority tends to be climate related. And I think if we deal with a lot of climate issues, we can also deal with uh, equity at the same time. Uh, we're all impacted by the same weather, uh, but people with equity issues have a harder time managing uh, uh, intense weather events, storms, things, things like that. So if we can manage those, uh, we can try to um, hit two birds with one stone, but hopefully leave those birds alive. <laughs> for me, it's the ability for people to work outside even, play outside, eat together outside and enjoy the natural world, which is what we are all a part of. And I think in this particular area of the city, it's really hard to do that because people are in large buildings in small apartments and we don't really have facilities for them in this area of our city. I think these are fantastic that the staff have organized these workshops. It gives the residents an opportunity to talk about what is important to them and then distill that into a report for council to decide where we can put capital dollars to make these ideas a reality in a future council, a future budget year. I thought this workshop was a very informative uh, way of getting the community involved in how to better utilize space in Tacoma Park and other areas. Um, and very, uh, very, yeah, just it's a very way, a good way of, uh, what I found very interesting is how passionate the people are about the community, you know and how it's utilized and, and uh, the best way of, of using this space to best benefit everyone, not only just the business, but the community as well. We just need things that people can really utilize, uh, like parks, like playgrounds. And there was one thing um, in the workshop that I was concerned with, and that was sidewalks for the seniors. So making them ADA and so seniors can get around the city better. So. Ward 5, the priority I would say is what's going to happen to the Washington Ventus Hospital campus. There are a lot of opportunities there, uh, but it's going to take a while before we can realize them. Uh, we got to make sure that the residents, not just surrounding the campus, but throughout the city, have input in what they want to see 
I think it is really critical that green space is a part of whatever development in that final project. But there'll probably be apartment buildings, there'll probably be some senior housing there, and some uh, a light retail footprint. But there will be uh, some new uh, development on that campus. Ward 2 is one of the old Prince George's County areas, and so it's got it's been underserved for some of the neighborhoods. There's a richness of open space and wooded area in some parts, and then in other parts, which is missing pocket parks and playgrounds and things and bike lanes, things that, that all different kinds of people are looking for. First and foremost, um, making sure that people are able to walk in their communities um, without fear of being ran over by cars. Um, Ward 6 is um, an area that is surrounded by highways between um, New Hampshire um, Avenue as well as University Boulevard. We have the Purple Line coming and so there's definitely a need for making sure that we have um, pedestrian and bike lane safety it is critical so that our residents are able to get around the community safely, which I think is really important. And we've made a, a number of strides in Ward 6 um, in terms of new sidewalks that have been created and, and are in the process of being reviewed. Um, but I think another thing that's really important is creating more public space for residents in Ward 6. Right now, we don't have many public parks. So we have two county parks, but we don't have other just open space and, and parklets and places for people to convene for our businesses and our residents to kind of come together to create a sense of community outdoors. Um, so I think that that's another big important issue um, that Ward 6 is facing. Um, and we're standing in the other item definitely making sure that we're making the necessary improvements in Ward 6 in terms of the rec center um, is really critical as well. So sidewalks and pedestrian and bike lane safety, creating more parks and outdoor spaces for people to gather um, and making improvements for the rec center are my priorities for our public space in Ward 6. We have all the information you could possibly want on our website, uh, which is the, if you go to the City of Tacoma Park website and type into the search bar, Public Space Management Plan, that will give you up-to-date information on when our next workshops are, what we've done so far, what we plan to do, PDFs of all the materials we use in these workshops. We've also been sending out information through social media on Tacoma Park's various channels uh, and flyering around town to let people know that there are three more workshops coming up later this month. Uh, in different parts of the city, and we really hope as many people as possible can come. When I was transitioning out of the military, I was given an opportunity to do therapeutic art and it was really helpful for me when I was transitioning and a lot of my friends. And so we said, you know, more, more veterans and their family members in military need an opportunity to, to do therapeutic art and then have a way to talk about it with the communities that we live in and kind of build relationships and wellness and healing through the arts. I started doing art actually tying flies for fly fishing and I didn't know it was art because otherwise I probably wouldn't have done it. Uh, and so I learned how to use different metals to make the flies uh, the tie when I was tying them so they'd sink or stay up. So I do metal art and wood art and I do a little bit of other stuff but mostly it's metal and wood because I, I'm not good at drawing or, or coloring um, or anything along those lines and so it's safe for me to do wood and metal and I get to break things. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> I am a um, 100% uh, disabled veteran and so I don't get out a lot um, and haven't, especially with um, the pandemic, uh, the last uh, year, 20, uh, 20 was really hard for, like it was for a lot of people. So I was reaching out, doing uh, my art, um, was reaching out through a lot of groups to try and um, be more social so I saw that uniting us was a like an art collective um, it, which had a focus on healing not 
just um, like art therapy, but they were actually like a collective of um, veteran artists and military artists and, um, and actually family members too who are artists uh, of veterans and their whole, I love their whole philosophy. And you could just register on, on their, on their, not just their Facebook group, but their, you could just go to their website and you could register as an, an artist. And, um, and that's what I did. Lately, what I've been doing has been collage. And I've actually, because you only need really a small corner studio office, a table, you know, and your materials. And so um, that's what I've been concentrating on is collage art. And um, I've actually found it really, really satisfying. And I've just been doing that mixed media type collage art for the past year or two. And, um, and that's where I've kind of found my niche and I've, I've really enjoyed it. What Uniting Us gives me now is a self-purpose that I hadn't had since I was in the Army. A lot of times you don't realize how mute you've become until you're whispering in the darkness. And so Uniting Us, you know, gave me my voice again, and I'll be in Really grateful for that. So I ha now have the creativity uh, again that uh, I didn't have before, and I think I'm a better mother because of that. And uh, and just by being like out tonight, you know, I wouldn't have been here a year ago if I didn't have United Us. I use found stuff. I use used clothes, junk mail. Uh, oh my gosh, anything. I, I can see beauty in anything. If they, someone sets a picnic table, they'll say, can you make something out of that? And I'm always saying, well, I can make a dress out of that, a tablecloth once y'all finish. You know, I can do this, that. And so it's just really exciting to repurpose things. And this particular exhibit, I have my dolls, and I make them from, uh, from junk mail, um, bottles, uh, old books, um, but to the particular pieces I have here today, I shouldn't say this, but it's too late. What happened was I was sick in the hospital and someone gave me a painting kit, but I didn't um, have anything to make things with. So I took my pillowcase and I painted the pillowcase to make one of the dolls that are up there. <laughs> And um, her fan is made from um, paper towels at the hospital, and her face and her head was made with uh, paper towels and the uh, hospital tape, and her arms are made from um, junk mail. Uniting Us believes in the, the healing of art. And, you know, I thought I was alone in that thing, you know, and um, Anne-Marie and Cassie and Tiffany, you know, they explained to me how, oh, man, people would love to see that, as opposed to me collecting all my pictures and painting them all or making my dolls at home. Like, a lot of my dolls were made um, when my husband was in the hospital. He got hit by a car in 2018, and he's paralyzed from the navel down. So as I sat in his room and I slept at the hospitals for like two and a half years in my wheelchair just to be with him so when he looked up he would see that someone cares about him, that he's not alone. And so while he was, was sleeping and getting better at the hospitals, I was doing art. We put out a call for submissions uh, from artists from across the D.C. area and then we received more than 100 submissions uh, both from individual artists and groups of artists and then as arts coordinator I curate the shows and, and pull them together and then the exhibitions typically are up for about two months in the community center. We have uh, an opening reception that we promote at the beginning of the uh, exhibition and then the artwork is up for two or so months and pretty much anybody who comes to the community center uh, can see their artwork. We're excited to work with Uniting Us. It's a veterans organization that works with artists uh, who are veterans. Sometimes they're first time artists, sometimes they're uh, long time artists. And so it's 
an out outlet for them, sort of not only for creativity, but often for healing after uh, some suffered uh, PS PTSD or other issues relating to their service. And we were just really excited to be able to share their artwork and to provide a venue for, um, for showing their work. I'm a wood carver and have been carving wood my whole life. During the Korean War, I was living with my grandfather in Minnesota. And when I was five years old, he gave me a pocket knife and taught me how to whittle. And now I'm still whittling and I even teach whittling. There's just so many facets to oneself that the different experiences you have, if you put them down as you're going through, then you have a diary of your life or of your experiences. And this is a journey that I'm going through and it's a journal that I'm keeping. One is a self-portrait of me. At the Renaissance Festival, I used to be King of Swords. And two years ago, I decided not to be that anymore. So I took a Bible verse, uh, Isaiah 2, 4, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares, spears into pruning hooks, and study war no more. And so that's me at the anvil pounding a wooden sword into a plowshare. The other one is a Chesapeake Bay piece, and it's a pelican with a fish in its bill, and little animals crawling around behind it. We get artists many different ways. So actually, we had a couple of your community members who are military family members that came visited tonight the uh, gallery and the exhibit and they're actually going to sign up and become artists for Uniting Us. But we also have outreach programs where we go to locations where there are veterans and their family members in the military and we recruit them and we say hey and they'll say well I'm not an artist and we say well that's okay you don't need to be a professional artist because we have artists that are beginner crafters all the way to professional and our art sits side by side and it's really the narrative the story of the experience that brings life to every piece of art we have our youngest artist is a four-year-old that's in new york and his grandma was active duty her name's penny lee and she's phenomenal and so he has work hanging right now actually in arlington national cemetery at the military women's memorial and then we also celebrate you know, others throughout the years and we have a World War II veteran that joined us in August um, and participated with us and a 94 year old um, that does bronze casting, has done bronze casting with us. And so we have everything from four years old to 90 plus years old and um, from all over the country and every military service is represented. Art for me um, started out as just going to a social engagement and participating with other people. Um, but there's a ton of research actually that's available that universities and the National Endowment for the Arts and the DOD and the Veterans Affairs that they've done that shows that art is very healing and that through that healing it creates and establishes a wellness activity as individuals for families and in communities. And so it really builds resilience and it helps create a narrative. So for example, a piece of art, you can look at it and go, oh, that's a hand carved heart. Um, but really, what is that represent? And so before I do a piece of art, I may not know. And then as I'm creating it, my uh, ability to tell that story and to explain what it is helps me understand how I'm feeling or my experience that I had. And we have artists all the time that say, I had no idea what I was doing. And as I was doing it, I realized what I was thinking, what I was trying to overcome, and they do it through making art. As the pandemic started happening, I noticed the good news that was happening. A lot of the good news that was happening was the art that was happening. Um, Anne-Marie had a really beautiful exhibit that had Norman Rockwell paintings at uh, the Women's Museum, and I just thought, how fabulous is this that veterans' art is also right next to such an iconic figure in American history? So I got in touch. It started off mostly as poetry, just poetry specifically. 
um, poetry and articles because my background was in um, a lot of different types of writing. So I thought I'll just stick with that. Um, but now as you see, it's turned into visual poetry and that came out of an abundance of different types of workshops. One specifically was in Oxford Brooks in the United Kingdom and I was taught by um, a beautiful artist, her name is Susie Campbell. She said, you know what, let's start thinking more visually because your words are very visual, so let's think about that as well into your poetry. So that's how that started. And from it, I started a technique that has been carried over for forever because people have been burning books. Um, I call it burn poetry. My piece is actually called Scapegoating in the Silver Age, and it's just that. It's about the Tyndale scriptures, it's about Yoko Ono, it's about the pangolins, it's about the bats, everything that you can think of throughout history that has been used as a scapegoat for something disastrous happening. And i.e. we're in a pandemic, and so a lot of the bats have been blamed for different things, and different types of wildlife have been blamed. We've, we've been putting blame everywhere. And so that came out in my artwork. Um, and so I just really wanted to take that and use that as the driving force of that narrative. And so that's what I got. I actually wrote a poem and it says, I am the vessel that holds the heart of which art lies within. And I truly feel that. I feel like because I was able to tell my story and get it from this vessel that I am and onto the page, it was one part of my journey. The next part was, okay, I don't just want to have this on a page, I also want to be able to share it um, visually. How do I make that come alive visually? And so from there it became a visual piece as you have here. And then that's sharing more of the story. And then from here to an exhibition and multiple exhibitions, I just feel like um, it's, like you said, come full circle. It really makes it come alive. I think this, ex this exhibit uh, in particular is fantastic. Um, being able to um, show with other veterans, um, for one, it got me out of the house and for typically housebound veterans like myself, um, that's huge. I really feel so honored to be a part of something like this because really people don't know that we even exist. And um, doing the art helps me with my PTSD and my MST, which is military sexual trauma. Um, it helps me from being depressed. So I do paint also. And so um, I have a piece at Arlington Cemetery at the Women's Memorial. I have a piece at Dulles Airport. Um, I, I just really feel honored that um, people like the things that I do and it keeps me from being depressed. This is a wonderful opportunity. It's a wonderful opportunity for veterans and it's a wonderful opportunity for the community. Um, for each community that she's brought us into, it helps bridge the civilian and the military divide. It helps us to tell our stories and to have an active participant. So I feel like by us having our art here, not only are we taking it from inside, and putting it outside, but we're also sharing it with um, our communities, which helps um, when you have a flourishing community, it just helps everybody kind of feel like they're participating, kind of feel like we're sharing in the narrative. This exhibit is nice. It's, it's good to have your work shown in different places. So when we started Uniting Us, it really was about a dignified way to have veterans and military and their families be able to tell their story and express kind of their feelings and their experiences. And I didn't understand always what it was going to turn out to be, but we have artists that come in, they might not exhibit their artwork, but they'll say, you saved my life. I was at a point where I didn't believe in myself at all anymore. I didn't understand what was going on in my, you know, in my life. And you helped give me structure in a community, the Uniting Us community, that gave me the support that I needed and I didn't even know that I needed it. Um, and so when we have those types of stories, it, it makes every hour and minute that we spend on this because we're all volunteers at Uniting Us, um, it makes it meaningful. And you know we're grateful to have the opportunity to be in a place like the Tacoma Park Community Center. 